The effective treatment of diseases like cancer relies on our ability to come up with drugs that are potent and safe. In the last lecture, we discussed the challenges of delivering drugs within the human body. We also looked at some of the most powerful drugs that we have at our disposal to fight cancer. And we also examined the limitations in their use that comes from side effects and formulation challenges. Nanoscience, as you know, brings a unique set of tools to problems like this one. And that's particularly true for the drug delivery challenge. It gives us a variety of structures at the nanoscale that could potentially be used to bring drugs to tumors in a way that is much more directly targeted. We've already talked about a variety of carriers, including nanotubes, liposomes, protein nanoparticles, and nanovalves. And a common feature of all of these is that they can carry drugs and they're potentially programmable to get to certain tissues to give us more specificity in the way that drugs are delivered. So we're now ready to look at some specific examples where these nanomaterials have been shown to be very effective at improving drug activity. So first, let's touch on how we evaluate the efficacy of a drug and how we evaluate improvements that could be realized when nanomaterials are used as carriers. Now, in the studies that we'll review, mice turn out to be a very important uh, system in which to gauge drug efficacy. And we have methods at our disposal that actually allow tumors to be transplanted into mice. And so they can serve as a good model and mimic what happens in human patients. So we can use mice to understand how much of a drug is in circulation as a function of time. And this is important so that we understand how much drug is there and how long it sticks around. In other lectures, we've talked about the fact that our kidneys and livers are good at removing chemical agents from our bodies. And so, again, it's quite important that we look at the kinetics of drug clearance and we understand how long it's present in a living organism. In analyzing the efficacy of new drugs, we'll also look at tumor volumes. So monitoring the size of a tumor in the presence and absence of a drug is a very direct measurement that tells us how well a drug is reaching the desired site and how well it's working. And you may wonder, how do we measure tumor volume? It's usually a, a simple measurement basically done with a, a ruler. So it's a, a crude type of evaluation, but it tells us exactly what's going on. We'll also look at response rates and survival rates. These values look at the overall effect of a drug and not only how the tumor responded to the drug, but how the animal as a whole responded. And many of the studies that we'll take a look at represent what we refer to as preclinical trials. These are studies that are typically done in academic labs to test whether modifications to an existing drug or a completely new drug has significant activity. And here we'll be looking at the influence of the inclusion of nanocarriers. And we'll also be looking at drugs that went all the way through a, serial, a series of clinical trials from the preclinical stage all the way through the clinical trials that were needed in order to gain FDA approval so that the drugs could be used in human patients. Just so that you have an appreciation of what this process the FDA involves, I want to quickly take you through the steps. Once the preclinical data is collected on cultured cells and mice, the next step is for a phase zero clinical trial to be organized. This study is collected or conducted on a small number of patients and is designed to very quickly understand what a drug does to the body and what the body does to a drug. Here, safety and the degree of efficacy for a drug are not really being assessed. And it's more about trying to match up uh, studies that may have been done in a mouse with a study being done in a patient. So after phase zero, a phase one trial is conducted. And this phase one trial uses a large group of healthy volunteers. And the healthy subjects are used so that the safety of a drug can be assessed. If a healthy person can't tolerate a drug, it's pretty unlikely that a cancer patient will. So this is an important thing to assess early on. And then if everything goes well with the healthy volunteers, the phase two trial then looks at how well the drug works in a cohort of cancer patients. Here, information on how the drug should be dosed is also collected. 
If up until this point effectiveness is observed, then a large phase three trial is set up. Now here a large group of patients is collected, sometimes into the thousands of patients, and these trials are randomized so that one half of the group is given the drug and the other half of the group is given a placebo. The improvements in survival can actually be small in drug trials, especially cancer drug trials. So it's quite important to look at these kinds of placebo effects and really document them. If the results of a phase three trial are positive, then a drug will typically be approved by the FDA. So this entire process can take about eight years, and the preclinical work with mice needed before you ever start a trial, and all of the discovery that needs to take place can take about six years. So this is a very long process that is involved with the development of a new drug. And for every thousand drugs that begin preclinical testing and are tested in research labs, only one goes to clinical testing. So now you should be able to appreciate why the list of drugs that we have to fight cancer is so small and why pharmaceutical companies really struggle to make progress. Time and the odds of success really work against drug development. But with all of this in mind, let's now take a look at an example of a drug that was coupled with a nanoscale carrier and this uh, new form of the drug was able to make it through the entire FDA process into clinical use. The name of this drug is Doxel. And as you might guess, it's based on the drug doxorubicin that we discussed in the last lecture. The vials of the drug that you're seeing in this image show you that bright ruby red color that I mentioned in the last lecture. Uh, some people actually refer to this drug as red death though, because it is not well tolerated. We talked about the fact that this drug causes cardiotoxicity and can impair the function of the heart. The images that you're looking at show a comparison between healthy heart cells and those that have been exposed to doxorubicin. And you can see that those cells are, are really perturbed and this is a consequence of the drug passing through the heart once it has been injected into the body. In the 1990s, researchers at the University of San Francisco and then a small company called Sequis, also based in the Bay Area, developed a new form of doxorubicin packaged inside a nanoscale carrier. The carrier that they used was a liposome. And on the inside of this particular liposome, floating around in a drop of water, was a collection of doxorubicin molecules. So every particle has many, many drug molecules within it. Now, what's holding them in place is a lipid bilayer and then a layer of polyethylene glycol. So what are these layers doing? Why do we need them? Turns out the lipid bilayer is very good at keeping water on the inside of a particle. The lipids are greasy in the middle, but then they have charge groups that the water really likes. So lipids are molecules that are abundant in cells, so they're biocompatible. On the surface of the liposome, the polyethylene glycol helps the particle stay in circulation. It helps the uh, circulation of the particle by keeping the immune system from attacking it and by making it think the particle actually belongs in the human body. This liposomal packaging system helps a dose of drug stay in the body longer. If we look at the kinetics of how fast unmodified doxorubicin stays in the blood, we see that the levels drop off precipitously. Within hours, the drug is basically gone. Now, if we look at doxel, the drug packaged in liposomes, it stays around much longer. So this means that the tumor, uh, or excuse me, that the drug has more time to find the tumor, and it also means that repeated doses don't need to be administered. So one of the first things that was noticed during the doxel clinical trial was that levels of cardiotoxicity were lowered. And the immediate conclusion was that since we didn't have to re-administer the drug and re-administer the drug, there was less buildup of the drug in the heart. And so we were suppressing cardiotoxicity that way. Another very interesting thing that was discovered uh, is that the cardiotoxicity was also suppressed because of the nanoscale structure of doxel. 
So by being larger than a regular mo molecule, the doxal particles were kept out of the crevices of the heart where they could do damage. So this was another thing that helped the drug be more effective. Doxal also takes advantage of the passive tumor targeting effects that we've discussed. One of the first conditions it was approved for was to treat Kaposi sarcoma. This is a skin tumor that is very often seen in AIDS patients. I once saw uh, Frank Zoka, one of the inventors of Doxal, he's a professor at, at UCSF, uh, I saw him talk about the clinical trials that were done with Kaposi sarcoma patients. And the images that he showed were really dramatic. One of the patients that they studied basically had tumors covering many parts of his body. And in the study, they labeled the drug with a dye that allowed them to see where it went. In the images that were shown, you could see almost perfect overlap between where the tumors were and where the drug went. It was really amazing to see that targeting really taking place. And again, this is just the targeting that happens because of the leakiness of the blood vessels around tumors, even tumors on the skin. So Doxel was approved for use by the FDA in 1995. It was shown to be particularly effective in Kaposi sarcoma patients who didn't respond to other treatments. And it's now been approved for the treatment of several other cancer types. So now let's move on to another nanodrug delivery success story. In the last lecture, we talked about Taxol, or Paclitaxel, and the problems with its solubility and formulation. When this drug is used clinically, it's administered as a solution. It's made into a liquid formula by dissolving it in a liquid called cremaform, which is a form of castor oil. So while Taxol, which as you know, binds to microtubules and disrupts the replication of cancer cells, uh, has a pretty good side effect profile. In addition, to make matters worse, because it is good at dissolving things, this solvent can dissolve the plasticizers in the tubing that is used to administer the drug intravenously. So Cremafor as a solvent not only has bad side effects, it's even dissolving parts of the delivery system that we need to get the drug into the body at all. So a company uh, called Abraxis, located in Los Angeles, developed a form of paclitaxel that allows it to be administered without any toxic solvents and they packaged it into nanoparticles of a protein called albumin. This protein is water soluble and it occurs naturally in humans and it also has a tendency to form nanoparticles that are about 100 nanometers in size. Even more important is that this protein can bind to receptors in blood vessels and it can give them a signal that allows the drug uh, protein complex to travel out of the blood vessel. And the drug is packaged inside the particle and it goes along for the ride. So by packaging this drug within a protein nanoparticle, the ultimate biodegradable vehicle, we get around the need to use toxic solvents. And the activity of the drug is very impressive. In a trial fo focused on metastatic breast cancer patients, the tumor response rate was twice as good for the nanoformulated drug. And to make things even better, only 30 minutes were needed for a complete IV dose of the drug instead of three hours. So this benefit, it may seem somewhat minor, but it really offers improved quality of life for patients being treated for met metastatic breast cancer. To shorten their time that they need to be in a hospital to get a drug dose definitely makes this easier to bear. And this type of treatment is, is in addition to being faster, it's more effective and it's safer. This form of paclitaxel was approved by the FDA in 2005. The clinical trials that were done, in addition to showing better patient responses, also showed dramatically lower levels of side effects. And the clinical community has really embraced the use of this drug, and over $300 million worth of the drug is sold every year. The company that developed it, Abraxis, was sold to a New Jersey-based pharmaceutical company, Celgene, for about $3 billion in 2010. So now that we've looked at two major advances in the development of more effective drugs that were made possible by nanoscale delivery vehicles, let's turn to some next-generation systems that also have significant potential.
There are lots of things that we can do with nanomaterials that are simply not possible without nanoscale structural control. Let me walk you through a very clever study that was done at MIT and reported in 2005 that really showcases the advantages of nanomaterials. The particles that this MIT group made actually had two layers. So the core of the particle was made of doxorubicin. And as you know, this drug will keep cancer cells from replicating. The outer layer of the nanoparticle had another molecule encapsulated with it, one that interferes with a process called angiogenesis. So angiogenesis is the process by which new blood cells, blood vessels, get made. Tumors need lots of angiogenesis to happen because they need a good blood supply to be provided to them so that they can survive. It's been hypothesized for some time that a way to shut down the growth of a tumor would be to starve the tumor of its blood supply. So these nanoparticles that should be able to do that would deliver a double whammy. They would hit the DNA inside the tumors, and then they would also hit the blood vessels outside of the tumor. So are these nanoparticles, these dual layer nanoparticles effective? Very much so. Their efficacy was tested in a mouse model of melanoma. And when these mice were treated with either doxorubicin or the anti-angiogenesis agent on its own, the mice only survived for 20 or 30 days. With the combined nanoparticle, they lived three times as long. So if we could reproduce that in human subjects, that would obviously be huge. To extend the, the lifetimes of cancer patients by three times would be really amazing. Now again, without the control to make these nanoscale layers, this type of approach wouldn't be possible. So again, I just want to emphasize that this is why nanotechnology is so powerful, because it really allows us to manipulate things at a fine level that can make a big difference for drug delivery. So we'll spend the last part of this lecture looking at a variety of systems that are all at a pretty early stage of uh, development, but they all show tremendous promise. So one uh, nanoparticle-based drug delivery system that I learned about very recently is something that's under development at Duke University in North Carolina. I was just down there a few weeks ago uh, visiting some collaborators and got to uh, meet a group of people in the bioengineering department there that were doing some very interesting work. So what they have been developing is a peptide-based nanoparticle that has produced some really dramatic results when used as a, an anti-cancer treatment. Again, at an early stage in models, but the, the early results are, are quite interesting. So what they did is they started off by engineering a peptide that would self-assemble around the drug doxorubicin. So the sequences that they developed, they thought long and hard about how to design these sequences to do this, and what they ended up with, once I describe it, you'll realize that they were able to mimic some of the features of a liposome, but with a peptide sequence. So on these peptides, there's a domain that has a, a section that is, is really able to uh, grab the drug. So this part of the peptide is kind of greasy, and the drug is kind of greasy, so they come together and they stick. On the other side of the peptide, is a, a group of amino acids that are very hydrophilic. So they love water. So they really want to be in water. The other part of the peptide wants to be near the drug. And so what that means is that if you take a solution of these peptides and the drug and water, the drug and the sticky part of the peptide goes inside and the hydrophilic part goes on the outside and you get a nice water soluble particle with the drug encapsulated inside it. So these peptides will spontaneously form 100 nanometer particles. So that's a good size for a drug delivery system. And what's really astonishing is that these nanoparticles, when they were tested in mice, after a single dose, increased the 60-day survival of these mice by 90%. So these were mice with tumors. Uh, they had an untreated population and watched their survival rates, and then they looked at the population, treated with the peptide nanoparticles, and there was an improvement of 90%. That's just absolutely, uh, you know, amazing relative to some of the other things that we've looked at. And, you know, what's special about these particles? Well, the peptide sequences were very carefully engineered. 
Uh, the peptides that they used are pretty small, so uh, the nanoparticles are a little bit smaller than what we've been looking at, and they seem to be pretty speedy at distributing the drug. It was also discovered these conjugates are good at allowing cells uh, to not become drug resistant, and this is likely because the drug is very fast acting. So it seems as though this, this system has been able to uh, provide a very effective drug delivery vehicle, but with some really special properties that gives it a, a very special level of activity. And it will be quite interesting to see what happens as this nanopackage drug goes through clinical trials. So now let's take a look at a pH sensing nanocarrier. We quickly touched on how these work in the last lecture. The person who led this study, his name is San Bin Nguyen, was a classmate of mine at Caltech. He's a really smart and very creative guy. He's now a professor at Northwestern, and his group came up with the idea of producing nanobins that could sense pH and selectively release a drug in response to a pH change. Now, if you look at the SEM image of these materials, they really do look like shallow bins. You could see how they could carry the drug around using that uh, depressed space. And so to get these bins, uh, they were able to develop a polymer that could be cross-linked. And the cross-linking is to hold the polymer together, to hold the particle together, and it allows them to load it with the drug doxorubicin. Now these polymer bins, because they're pH responsive, they shrink when the pH is lowered. So as that pH goes down, the bin just collapses on itself, and eventually that squeezes all the drug out. So this is almost like a nano sponge. And so why were they focusing on pH as a way to release the drug? Well, it turns out that cancer cells have a lower pH than healthy cells. Uh, the metabolism of cancer cells is really perturbed. They don't function as normal cells do, and that drives the intracellular pH down. So the idea here is that they would be able to get preferential drug release in the cancer cells. Now, when they tested these interesting nanostructures in a mouse model of breast cancer, it worked extremely well. They imaged the tumors while they were still in the animal, and they could see them shrinking significantly. And importantly, just injecting the animals with the bins on their own had no effect. We haven't really talked about this, but it is always extremely important to test an empty carrier when it's being evaluated as a delivery agent. There are many structures or molecules out there that look pretty innocuous, and you think, yeah, that's a good carrier, probably won't do anything, but you never know. And, and structures, again, that seem like they should be pretty stable can have strange effects when they're taken up into cells. So it's always important to look at the empty carrier and make sure there's no effect there. Now, in the last lecture, we looked at carbon nanohorms that could hold cisplatin. We just took a brief look at this as we were surveying different types of nanomaterial carriers. And these nanohorns do something really interesting. They bind to the surface of the cell, and they seem to be able to poke through the cell membrane and deliver the drug right into the cell. The group that did this work, which is based in Japan, was able to show that the potency of the drug improved by about sixfold in a mouse model, and there was no weight loss observed for these mice, and that's a common problem with cisplatin. This group also checked very carefully to make sure that the carbon nanohorns didn't cause any toxicity on their own. Again, an important check for this kind of material, which could cause inflammation or other problems if it accumulated to high levels. So let's also look at the use of a carbon nanotube transporter. Drugs can be put on the inside of carbon nanotubes. We've talked about that a little bit. And we've also mentioned the fact that it can be adhered to the outside. And this is a really cool idea because it allows just a small amount of drug to be carried on the nanotube and then released when it reaches its target. This work on coding carbon nanotubes was done at Stanford in the lab of Hongji Dai. And Hongji is one of the pioneers in carbon nanotube chemistry. He's done all kinds of things with carbon nanotubes. And so the, his group tested this doxorubicin nanotube approach in a mouse model of lymphoma, and the results look really good. This conjugate, just like doxel, which we talked about at the beginning of the lecture, seemed to decrease damage in non-tumor sites. 
So interestingly, when they looked at doxorubicin on its own, they saw significant damage in the intestine of the mice that they were testing. But this damage basically disappeared once they attached or adsorbed the drug onto carbon nanotubes. And most importantly, tumor growth was completely arrested, survival rates went way up, and the side effects were minimal. So now let's look at one last example, a targeted polymer nanoparticle. This drug delivery system was invented at MIT uh, by the group of Bob Langer. And you'll hear lots more about Bob Langer's work when we discuss nanoscale tissue engineering. But it, his group also works in drug delivery, and they came up with the first targeted drug-containing nanoparticle. This particle has a polymer core that's very good at binding an anti-cancer drug. In this case, they used a drug called docetaxel, and this is a, a relative of paclitaxel. And what is unique about this system is what they attach to the outside of the particle. So here they incorporated a recognition domain that allows the particle to specifically pick out prostate cancer cells. These types of cells have a special protein on their surface, and so this is what the Langer group directed the recognition element towards. To test the drug, they implanted prostate tumors into mice. And what was really remarkable here is that the tumors in the treated mice basically disappeared. They shrank and shrank and shrank and then disappeared. So this is a really dramatic result, and we think it results from the specific targeting of this system and the directing the drug right to the prostate tumors. So now we've looked at a variety of nano-enabled delivery systems. We've looked at protein nanoparticles and liposomes that are used clinically to deliver drugs with greater potency and fewer side effects. We've looked at next generation approaches that combine some very interesting activities and, and also specificity domains. And it's really probably this last angle where heightened specificity is obtained to lessen effects on healthy cells that will be an increasing focus of this field. Of all the examples we looked at, the one with the most specificity, the one that had a recognition element that was able to specifically bind a prostate cancer cell, this was the one that achieved the most dramatic results with complete ablation of a tumor observed. So I think we'll be seeing more and more work in this area. It's also important to realize that nanoscale drug delivery has applicability in a variety of disease states, not just cancer. And there is very interesting work going on in a number of different areas. So cardiovascular medicine, uh, diabetes, there are nanoscale drug delivery systems under development for these diseases that have some similarities to what's going on in cancer drug delivery, um, but with some subtle differences that have to do with the exact type of disease that's trying to be treated. So in general, it's clear that the pace of progress in nanoscale drug delivery is rapid and it will likely continue to be producing very exciting advances in the short term. In the next lecture, we'll look at nanoscale surgical tools. These can be, can be used to perform surgical procedures one cell at a time. We'll survey a variety of literally cutting edge systems that can be used to make uh, surgical excisions cleaner and faster to heal. We'll also look at very small surgical tools that can excise disease cells with incredible precision, a very exciting capability. See you then. As you've listened to our lectures, I'm sure you've wondered about how nanotechnology discoveries are actually made and how the research gets done. We decided to devote this lecture to telling you about the research process in nanotechnology so that you have a clearer idea about what kinds of people are involved, how it's funded, and how we move discoveries out of research labs and into commercial products. There are thousands of academic labs across the world that are working on nanotechnology-related projects, and hundreds more research labs at companies, government labs, and research institutes. This is a very large community of people 
all working towards realizing the applications of nanotechnology that we've discussed in this course. Now you might wonder what kind of training is required for nanotechnology researchers. Well, you'll find that almost anything goes. People with some type of background in almost any area of basic science can find a place on a nanotechnology research team and make an important contribution. What's really unique about the teams that work on nanotechnology research is that they're highly interdisciplinary. In order to move projects forward, it's often necessary to have people with chemistry, physics, and biology in their background. And it's also important to have people with engineering training involved. The chemists can help us generate new materials, the physicists can help us understand the properties of new materials, and biologists can help us put biomolecules and nanomaterials together. The engineers help us turn basic discoveries into devices, an important step in getting new science turned into solutions for medicine, computing, or energy. To make this more tangible for you, I thought I would introduce you to some of the members of my research group so that you can get an idea of how people work together. I serve as the principal investigator leading a team of about 20 researchers from a variety of different backgrounds. We are a cross-faculty group and we draw people from the Faculty of Medicine, Faculty of Pharmacy, Faculty of Arts and Sciences, and the Faculty of Engineering. And in addition to having uh, people with different backgrounds, uh, people come into the group and join the team at a variety of levels. So some are graduate students earning a master's or a PhD degree. Some are postdoctoral researchers who are getting more experience after their PhD. And then some of our team members join us as research associates after getting their undergraduate degree. One of my projects focuses on the development of a new type of DNA-modified quantum dot that can form really neat three-dimensional networks. The lead on this project is Paul Lee. Paul is a chemist and he got his PhD at Caltech. Uh, he actually worked in the same lab that I did as a graduate student. And Paul has really helped us perfect the chemistry that makes our materials functional and highly luminescent. So you'll see Paul holding a, a tube of material that's really glowing, and it's glowing so brightly because of all the chemistry that he's used to optimize it. And so Paul's deep expertise in understanding chemical reactions makes all the difference here. Now, Paul works closely with a master's student named Davis Holmes. Davis has an undergraduate degree in engineering physics. And so he comes at this same project from a totally different perspective. Davis can help us think about the behavior of the quantum dots we make and why their electronic properties change in the presence of DNA. And having someone with this skill set on the project is really critical so that we understand how to give our quantum dots the highest level of performance possible. As you know, we also work on making nanomaterials-based sensor chips in my lab. And here we also need lots of different kinds of expertise. This is Mario Moscovici, and Mario is a master's student with a mechanical engineering background. Mario is working on developing a device that will capture circulating tumor cells out of blood samples for early cancer detection. His mechanical engineering experience helped us figure out how to flow solutions around our chips, and this is a really essential capability. We also need biology and biochemistry expertise on this project in order to understand how to work with the DNA and RNA molecules that we're trying to sense. This is Sean Guo. Sean has a undergraduate degree in biochemistry, and he's now a master's student with us. And he's working on getting our chips to detect viruses. So Sean came in with the expertise to help us with the biochemical aspects of this project, but as you can see, he now works with pretty sophisticated electronic equipment. This is a, a workstation where Sean is figuring out how to break up the viral particles with an electric field so that we can analyze them. So Sean has really had to stretch beyond what he learned as a graduate student and actually learned some electrical engineering. And this is very typical for members of a nanotechnology team. They're always learning something new. Alex Zaragoza brings a background in biology to our chip sensor project. Alex has an understanding of the markers within cells that can tell us that a cell is cancerous. 
He's engineering a chip to make it pick up on leukemia biomarkers. And since he's been with us, he's learned all kinds of things outside of the biology that he came in with. So he's learned aspects of electrochemistry, chip engineering, bioanalysis, all new skills. And you heard in a previous lecture about the results of his work, a really powerful new diagnostic tool for leukemia. Now, on the chemistry side of the project, we have Brian Lamb, who is working on a PhD in chemistry. Brian is really good at developing new types of materials chemistry. Here, he's sitting at our scanning electron microscope, and he's imaging one of the chips he made. And while he waits for the image to come up, he's actually giving Davis Holmes a tutorial on how SEM works. This is a common occurrence on our team. One member with a certain expertise can help another fill the gaps in their background. And this is one of the ways that these team members are able to learn about all of the different areas that are involved in nanotechnology by educating one another. Now you can see Brian zooming in on the surface of the chip. You can see the nanomaterials he deposited on the chip now coming into focus in real time. And SEM is just one of the techniques that Brian uses every day. He moves back and forth between our clean room where he fabricates devices, sometimes over to our workstation where he makes DNA molecules, then he does some electrochemical measurements, and it just goes on and on. Nanotechnology researchers have to be incredibly versatile. They're always changing gears, and they usually never do the same thing two days in a row. So now I think you can see that people that work on these types of nanotechnology teams, they, they all have their own specialization. But at the same time, they really have to become broader and broader as they work. And this is a, a very unique aspect of nanotechnology research. The team members need to be willing to be very versatile, go back and forth between different techniques, and they're constantly teaching themselves something new. And that's quite different from more traditional areas of science where you typically learn one thing really deeply, and that's your area of specialization. Nanotechnology researchers tend to be much, much broader, and they're exposed to all sorts of things during their careers. And I think this is why many are attracted to the field. It has a unique set of challenges that really appeal to people that are curious and like learning new things. Now, you might wonder, how do we pay all these people, and how do we buy all of the instrumentation that you've seen? Well, we get our funding from a variety of sources, the government, private foundations, and, and companies. In Canada, we get funding from both the provincial government and the federal government. Uh, in the United States, most of the funding comes from the federal government. A healthy budget for a group of about 20 is close to a million dollars a year. And the money gets split pretty evenly between personnel costs and supplies and equipment. Nanotechnology research is actually a bit more expensive than other types of scientific research. We need lots of sophisticated equipment, and our teams are big because we need so many different types of expertise. It's a, a pretty major undertaking, actually, to raise this kind of money. And getting money from the government, whether it be the National Institute of Health, the National Science Foundation or the Department of Defense involves writing very long, detailed proposals that describe a project we want to work on. And once we assemble the proposal and send it off, it undergoes very rigorous peer review. And unfortunately, it's not uncommon for a proposal to get turned down several times before it gets funded, so we also spend quite a bit of time iterating on and improving proposals. But the system really works in that it prioritizes high-quality, high-impact research. Now, what are the tangible outcomes that come from this kind of investment? Well, we disseminate the results of research in many different ways. And then the ways the results get used differ depending on what the application is. To get the word out about what we've discovered, we write papers and patents, and we attend conferences where new results get reported. Now, if the research that we do is quite basic in nature, like work done to develop a new material or imaging technique, the outcomes may take a while to materialize. Basic research serves as the foundation for more applied research focused on different applications. So very often, more follow-up work is needed before anything can be brought to the marketplace or commercialized. 
But basic research is really important. This is where the most game-changing discoveries are often made. And that's because it's usually curiosity-driven, and it can take a project in unexpected directions. So for example, uh, a few years ago, my group started working on a, a project where we were, we were studying some very basic materials that were based on peptides. And when we started, we were mainly just curious about what the properties of the materials would be, and we didn't really have any particular application in mind. But after working with them for a few years, we've learned how to make them into powerful drug delivery agents. And we found that they can attack even the most resistant cancer cells. So clearly, it's really important for researchers to pursue sound basic ideas, even if the immediate impact is not clear. Now, for nanotechnology research that is more applied, a few different things can happen. If patents were generated from the work, an existing company may be interested in licensing them. They would then turn the research into a product, and once it's commercialized, they would pay the inventors and the universities where the patents were generated a royalty. And this very often happens when new drugs are created. It takes lots of money to develop drugs and put them through FDA trials. We've talked a little bit about that. And so typically, those patents are licensed by companies with pretty deep pockets so that they can take it all the way through all of the clinical trials that are needed. Now, for certain types of inventions, it actually makes more sense for a new company to be created. We refer to these companies as spin-offs or startups. And what is this the best route? Well, in some industries, and the diagnostics industry is one example, a new technology actually needs to be very mature before it can be licensed. But it's not really possible to do the kind of work that is needed to mature a technology to the stage in a university lab. Uh, it needs to be done in a regulated environment so that the technology can get FDA approval eventually. And the optimization that needs to be done is not really suitable for students earning a degree. So here, if a company can be created and funded, it's a good way to get a technology to market. Now, how do you fund a company to take those next steps? Well, there are many different channels, but one of the best for nanotechnology research is raising venture capital. The advantage of working with venture capitalists and giving them equity in a company in return for an investment is that in addition to getting their money, uh, you also get to access their network of contacts and their experience that they've gotten working with other companies. But it's not easy. Uh, the amount of venture capital is shrinking, and it's becoming more and more competitive to raise this kind of money. I've actually been involved with two startup companies. One that I co-founded after my PhD studies was called Genome Sciences. This company was set up in 2000, right when the idea of using genomics for medicine was getting really hot. We developed a variety of tools for genetic analysis and eventually commercialized a series of tests for antibiotic-resistant bacteria. This company was backed by a variety of venture capitalists, and it was eventually sold for $250 million in 2005. Ted Sargent and I just recently co-founded a company called Exogenic. Exogenic is commercializing the chip-based diagnostic technology that our groups co-developed. And Exogenic will produce a variety of tests that will enable more rapid diagnosis of infectious disease. It's early days at Exogenic, so I can't tell you when the products will hit the markets, but we hope to be successful with getting our nanomaterials-based chips commercialized quickly. So these are just two examples from my own experience of how academic nanomaterials research can get commercialized. Um, I think they're pretty representative, though, of how discoveries move out of academic labs and eventually are turned into products. So now I'm going to hand things over to Ted, who will tell you uh, about a few experiences he's had commercializing nanotechnology research. And he'll also tell you about some other aspects of how nanotechnology research gets done. Just like Shana, I've been very interested in commercializing the fruits of research that happened within my group at the University of Toronto. And I've gotten to do that in the last couple of years. It's been incredibly exciting. You know, well before we started this company, which is called Envisage, for about four years leading up to that, I'd been working in the field of colloidal quantum dots, which we've spoken about in this course earlier. 
Uh, and what's so exciting about these materials is twofold. First, that you can synthesize them in solution, and so you can simply coat them onto things. You can, you can essentially make a paintable or a sprayable semiconductor. And that in addition to that, uh, you can tune them. We've talked about the quantum size effect, the fact that you have a, a material that you can really customize towards certain applications. And uh, we, we've been working with them for a while, and really what we were trying to do is to understand uh, what's the potential of these materials. There's various ways you could see using them in light emission, which is very relevant to displays, um, or in energy capture, very relevant to solar energy harvesting. Um, but we ended up discovering that our devices made extremely good photodetectors, extremely sensitive detectors for light. And that, of course, turned out to be very useful uh, when you combine it with the spectral tunability of these materials, the fact that we could engineer a set of materials such that they were visible light sensors, very useful in the visible imaging that we all do every day. Um, but we could also engineer them to see in the infrared, to see at wavelengths that we can't see with our own eyes, and therefore potentially to create an image sensor uh, that gave entirely new capabilities that went beyond uh, conventional vision and imaging. Uh, and so in about 2005, uh, we made the discovery that it was possible to make these very, very sensitive photodetectors. And uh, I had always wanted to commercialize uh, some of the fruits of my research. I, I was really looking for, for a time when we said, wow, we've got something that nobody else has. We, we got there first, we, uh, we invented it, we patented it, and, uh, and we've got a really special advantage in, in going out there and building a company, building products, taking them all the way to the market. Uh, and so that's what we did in 2005, 2006. We managed to attract investors into Envisage. In the past couple of years, uh, we've built prototypes that <clears throat> prove the capability of these materials to uh, enhance the sensitivity of image sensors, uh, the kinds of image sensors that are inside your, your uh, cell phone, inside your mobile phone. Uh, we've shown that it enhances them in many ways. It allows us to take them out into spectral regimes that have previously been unher unheralded when silicon was the basis for image sensing. Uh, it's allowed us to put new functions into these chips uh, because of the way uh, silicon chips work where they utilize silicon for the light sensing function as well as for the electronics that drives the chip. Um, they've been limited in how complex they could make the electronics because real estate was scarce since they were sharing it between the light sensing uh, and the circuit function. Uh, we realized with an Envisage once we brought together a team of amazing circuit designers and experts in material science, we realized that we were able to break those compromises uh, and make image sensor circuits that uh, delivered new functions, like uh, a true electronic shutter uh, that uh, gets rid of the jitter that you see in cameras uh, today. Uh, and so this has been a, a very exciting part of, uh, uh, of the work, and it's been incredibly gratifying to see that we can do more than just um, uh, you know, build uh, materials, build devices that uh, evince the potential of work on the nanoscale and that we've actually been able to turn them into real prototypes, uh, ultimately into products uh, that evince what we're talking about when we talk about how excited we are about engineering at the nanoscale. You know, I've actually learned a lot, not just about commercialization, but also about nanotechnology through this experience in nanotechnology commercialization. So, for example, you might think with these remarkable materials, with these very special properties, uh, that uh, all these, these exotic ideas would have to mean high cost. Uh, but in fact, the work that we do in Shano's commercial activities as well are all about using nanomaterials for these very specific purposes where they're really needed in order to achieve our technical objectives, um, but in a way that doesn't have to mean high cost. In fact, it can mean low cost, and it has in both of our cases. Um, so it doesn't, uh, doesn't have to be a compromise, if you like. We can have a low cost and high performance simultaneously. Uh, you know, another thing that I've learned through the course of this, you know, I had this, I had this idea before getting the company going, but uh, this became so much more tangible as we built it, that nanotechnology doesn't have to stand alone. We don't have to be interested in nanoparticles or nanotubes for their own sake or in isolation, um, but that it can be very compelling to take a new technology, a new capability, and marry it with an established one. Uh, so in the case of Envisage, uh, it's that we're taking a, a new light sensing capability and we're putting it onto the platform of microelectronics, a platform that has been developed, rendered robust, rendered cost effective, render, rendered manufacturable over decades. Uh, and it's really a synergy between this new element that the nanomaterials bring, uh, but this very sound and stable platform of microelectronics 
uh, that has enabled to build something uh, rapidly that's been very compelling. I thought I'd tell a, a couple of stories about three examples of people that have inspired me uh, in the field. People who are, uh, they're thought leaders, they've made huge technical and scientific contributions, but uh, I think as often as in the case for the people one really admires, they even go beyond that as well. Uh, so my first example is that of Paul Weiss. And uh, Paul fairly recently moved from uh, Penn State to UCLA, where he directs the California Nanosciences Institute. Uh, and Paul does some incredibly beautiful science, a science that pertains to really gaining an atom-scale understanding and control over the properties of materials. He's very uh, talented in the use of scanning tunneling microscopes to do this. In fact, he notes that, that uh, one of the uh, almost magical elements of the scanning tunneling microscope is that you can both sense and you can also move matter. You can displace atoms. You can control where they end up uh, using your scanning tunneling microscope. It's a very powerful tool. And uh, what's, what I find so compelling about the way Paul does science is that he, he really insists that uh, when it gets interesting is when he's exploring phenomena, ground rules, uh, limits that are different. They're really distinct as a result of being at the nanoscale. Uh, and so he, he, his curiosity really focuses on understanding what it is about engineering or doing science at the nanoscale that confers entirely new properties. Another thing about Paul that's so remarkable is that with a, a huge group, uh, a very compelling program that's known internationally, uh, at the same time, he took it upon himself to found a new journal for the dissemination of, of the very best nanotechnology research. Uh, and it's known as ACS Nano. ACS is the American Chemical Society, which publishes a lot of the top journals in the field. And this is a new journal uh, that Paul was involved in from the very beginning. Uh, and, you know, academics, and especially in the field of nanotechnology, but academics generally, uh, you know, they're always looking out for uh, the very strongest journal, the one with a great reputation, one where by being able to publish in one of these journals, uh, the, the glory of that journal is kind of showering down on the scientists for, for their capacity to publish in such a great venue. Uh, and so it's very difficult to build a journal from scratch. Uh, in fact, your, your reach, the extent to which people notice and cite the works in it is inevitably going to be less when you, got it, when you get it going. Well, Paul took what I thought was a very innovative approach. First, he right when we were getting into social networking and, uh, and social media, uh, Paul started to use the tools uh, of, of uh, disseminating information in a very accessible way over the Internet. Uh, in fact, as cute, his, the little video clips that he did were called Nanotube, uh, in which you could watch scientists talking about the work that was being published in his journal that month. Uh, and then the other approach that he took that was very, uh, is a very sort of a fostering or nurturing approach uh, is that, you know, instead of kind of, his technique for raising the stature of his journal being to say no to a lot of people, uh, which is one way to do it. It's just to be extremely discriminating. Uh, Paul did that, and he had to do it, but it really felt like the way he drove it forward was by going out and attracting the people who he thought was, were doing the most exciting work and, and saying to them, listen, you should publish in my journal. We know each other. Everybody likes Paul. He's everybody's friend. So, you know, uh, come publish in my journal. It'll be great for you. It'll be good for the journal. People did it. They responded to him, and as a result... Uh, he's doubled the impact factor over a couple of years, which means that he's taken his journal from being one that people cited at a reasonable level to being one of the strongest journals uh, in the field, all through this positive force of attracting uh, the best scientists uh, to work with him. Another person who's been a real inspiration, in fact, to uh, I think pretty much everybody born in Canada, he's, he's kind of a model, is uh, John Planey, who's a professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, John won the Nobel Prize in 1986, uh, for his uh, really, uh, you know, invention of a new field uh, in concert with a few others. Uh, it's a field of research in chemistry called reaction dynamics. And essentially, John and, and, and a few other colleagues who shared the 1986 Nobel Prize with him won it for providing a much more detailed understanding of how chemical reactions occur. And uh, John, in particular, advanced the method of infrared chemiluminescence, where he's able to essentially see the energy that was coming out of a chemical reaction in real time and use its spectral properties to see where the energy was going, to do kind of a complete balance or a complete uh, accounting for these reactions. Uh, and since then, because uh, that was in 1956 that John made those discoveries, though the Nobel Prize didn't come till 1986. Uh, but since then, and, and prior to then as well, he's just he's started new efforts and new fields and, and new endeavors entirely. One of the most exciting things that he does now is surface-aligned photochemistry, where he recognizes that 
the angle with which two molecules interact with each other will drive the kind of chemical reaction that occurs, uh, what the products will be. Uh, and so he takes advantages of, of having uh, a surface of atoms that's extremely well controlled, the kinds of things you can measure with your scanning tunneling microscope, uh, the kind of things on which you can move around molecules using your scanning tunneling microscope tip. Uh, and he uses it to poise molecules in specific orientations uh, and then bring in other molecules at specific angles. And so he's able to discover uh, and understand better the influence of uh, the, the, uh, the geometry, the relationships between molecules in space and an angle, and how that actually drives reactions. And so it's some incredibly deep science uh, that says uh, we want to understand these reactions at the deepest level. Uh, another way in which he's really inspiring, though, that goes beyond the science that he does, he was, as I was saying, uh, you know, a hero to school children growing up in Canada, not so you know, somewhat small country in terms of population, a countable number of, of uh, Canadians who won the Nobel Prize, who are still working in Canada today, of, of whom John is one. And John decided to use this uh, well-learned platform uh, to be very vocal on other subjects as well as to, to, uh, to influence uh, public policy and really public thinking. Uh, he's really a scientist for peace, somebody who's spoken out and who has a resonance nationally and internationally on the subjects of peace, on how we should think about uh, nuclear armaments, uh, nuclear energy. Uh, and I think he really takes the approach that uh, it's certainly uh, something that scientists are entitled to do. In fact, it's almost something that scientists are required to do, is to use their platform and their deep understanding of the technical or scientific issues that underlie what they're speaking about, that underlie a lot of important questions in public policy, and to be vocal about them, that, that, that it's really their duty. Uh, and John inspires a lot of people that way. Another scientist who has inspired many in the field of nanotechnology, including those particularly passionate about working on problems in energy, is Michael Gretzel, who's at École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne in Switzerland. Uh, and Michael is acknowledged as the inventor of uh, the first efficient dye-sensitized solar cells. These are essentially the first uh, solar cells that showed promise for being uh, very low in cost and therefore got people excited about the concept of you know, integrating solar cells into somebody's backpack. Uh, but there, there's also uh, some, there's some fascinating chemistry at work, some fascinating inorganic chemistry. And Michael managed to make uh, that field uh, and adding photons into it and harvesting energy with it into an incredibly exciting one. Uh, and what I find so striking about uh, Michael Gretzel's work today is that, like the other people that I mentioned, I mean, he's so uh, distinguished on the world stage. He's, he's won the Millennium Prize for Finland. Uh, he could easily rest on his laurels if he wanted to. Uh, but in fact, he has exactly the opposite approach. The science that he does today, for one thing, it's prolific, uh, but he, he just studies in incredible depth and detail every element of the system that he invented. And so he's had these uh, large impact papers that have really influenced people. Uh, and then by teaming with researchers all around the world and uh, Israel and in Japan and in Korea, and uh, we collaborate with the my group, people in the US, people around the world get to participate in this community of research surrounding understanding the fascinating chemistry and physics that underlie this new class of, of devices that Michael and his team invented. Of course, I've spoken about uh, commercialization of nanotechnology. Uh, Shane has spoken quite a bit about how nanotechnology actually gets done within universities. But within large companies, uh, there's a great deal of a very exciting activity. In fact, in many respects, large companies have an advantage. Uh, they are already uh, product companies today. Uh, they already know how to manufacture and ship and, and uh, be profitable, one hopes. Uh, but uh, in addition to that, in their research arms, uh, they have the potential to look down the road 5, 10, 15 years into the future, figure out where they have strengths and where there are needs available. Uh, and so DuPont, for example, uh, is one company that's done some fascinating work. Uh, there were uh, actually a, a, you know, an academically very prestigious paper published by a DuPont group on sorting carbon nanotubes with the aid of DNA, where different sequences of DNA could essentially recognize different classes of carbon nanotubes. Um, something that has since had a lot of uh, direct impact and, and uh, practical importance is uh, DuPont's realization of flexible substrates for photovoltaics. Uh, if the real promise of solar cells based on roll-to-roll -roll processing, essentially printing solar cells the way we print newspapers is to be achieved, then it will be on flexible substrates that are reliable, uh, cost-effective, in some cases optically transparent. Uh, and, and people at DuPont have uh, really shown leadership in that very important field.
IBM research is a, a fascinating place where many discoveries uh, from the last decades have occurred. Uh, of course, the researchers who, who uh, developed the scanning tunneling microscope, Bidding and Rohr, uh, were at IBM Zurich. Um, there has been uh, some of the most important work on carbon nanotubes and graphene, uh, especially in the context uh, of electronics. The electronic properties of these materials have been advanced by uh, Fedin Novoris at IBM Research. And uh, this is where one of IBM's great advantages is, is, is so obvious, that especially in the field of electronics, there's a pathway there um, to figure out how to take these upstream discoveries, this R&D, and transform it into reliable, robust manufactural devices, which is really one of the central challenges of that area. And it's an area where IBM has just recently shown some very striking results in really integrating these new classes of materials, these new concepts, onto silicon. Uh, in the field of photovoltaics, uh, they've also shown leadership with David Mitzi's work uh, on, on looking at a new earth-abundant materials that can be processed in a very cost-effective way uh, and turned into energy harvesting uh, materials. Uh, and as we've discussed uh, throughout the course, Chris Murray's work on colloidal quantum dots and building super lattice materials and devices out of them uh, has come uh, out of IBM research, as has Yuri Vlasov's work that we discussed in the context of silicon photonics, trying to put light onto a chip. Intel is, is kind of another, uh, another animal entirely there. There's this uh, very uh, well-defined, very focused uh, enterprise within Intel on just bringing us the next generation of integrated circuits as, as they've done so successfully for decades. Uh, and so the FinFET that we spoke about earlier uh, came directly uh, out of Intel, out of research done there, aimed at figuring out how to wrap a gate electrode uh, around the channel, essentially, of a transistor in order to allow scaling to smaller and smaller dimensions. And uh, speaking of which, that scaling itself uh, is something in which uh, uh, Intel has, has always been very much in the lead in figuring out how we will get to that next lithographic node, figuring out how we can extend uh, the, the incredibly long uh, lifetime of photolithography down to smaller and smaller length scales. I hope that you've uh, enjoyed this kind of perspective on how research gets done, research that happens in university labs, research that gets spun out from there, uh, how, how uh, academics make an impression on each other uh, through their publications in interdisciplinary journals, how they, how they talk to each other through those venues, uh, and how uh, research happens within big companies. You can see that the uh, research and the transformation uh, into innovation, into products, it's really an ecosystem. It's, uh, uh, it's got the incredibly important foundations of basic research, without which we would not understand uh, how to talk to the nano world, how to measure the nano world, uh, how to think about what materials we can build, what, what's possible. Uh, and then it has uh, researchers who kind of reach upstream and who find new materials, new concepts, and try to translate them uh, into things that are practical. Uh, and then those that are willing to take that uh, even further, uh, take it into companies and transform it uh, robustly into products. And it's because this ecosystem exists, it's because there are researchers who are passionate at every stage within that ecosystem, uh, that nanotechnology really is starting to have uh, an impact on our lives, a growing impact with every day. Much of this course, we've concerned ourselves with nanotechnology from the point of view of its applications, from the perspective of what it can enable. And, and why not? I mean, so many of us are passionate about this field because of what we can do with it. But I think there's another interesting perspective to bring to the field, which is there are so many beautiful things that we can create, such amazing materials, such amazing images, some of the pictures that people are taking on the nanometer length scale using their transmission electron micrographs or their scanning tunneling microscopes are so beautiful and so fascinating. I think it's interesting to view nanotechnology almost through the lens of art or design or architecture. Uh, and uh, so we'll start with the building blocks themselves, and then we'll think about the buildings. We'll think about what different types of structures we can engineer, uh, and then how we can build those into more uh, complex uh, buildings from these building blocks. Here's a couple of examples of some of the more interesting uh, building blocks. Think of it as kind of a, an artist's portfolio of what they can do. Uh, we have on the top left a nanoparticle, something we spend lots of time on throughout this course. It can be kind of uh, approximately a sphere, although you can often see hints at it having 
crystal facets. And since these are crystalline arrays, they do possess facets. Those facets ending, end up being the basis for a lot of the shapes uh, that you see elsewhere here, uh, the pyramids, the cubes, uh, the structures that have a hexagonal cross-section, uh, things that look like die that you might roll, uh, or tetrapods, or pointed objects, or even stars. These, these structures uh, are ultimately having their origins traceable to the underlying crystallinity uh, that is at, at their base. Now, another thing that we can do, sort of the first thing you can imagine doing once you have a nanoparticle available, is that you can build further on top of it. And so people call these core shell structures. Uh, we can start with a particle having a particular crystal lattice, and then we can grow on top of it some kind of shell, typically of another material. We use the term epitaxy to describe the growth of crystals on top of other crystals, and key to the word epitaxy is the idea that the crystalline periodicity, the spacing amongst the atoms in the first material, is perfectly mimicked in the second material that lies on top of it. We use the term heteroepitaxy to describe the growth of a shell of a second type of material on top of a first material. Now, these heteroepitaxial core shell nanoparticles have properties that go well beyond those that are embedded in the cores alone. We've talked already about how with the core size, we can change quantum confinement. We can change the band gap of the structure. But with a shell, for example, we can wrap a core uh, within a shell where the shell is prone to attract excited electrons into it, but it's prone to repel the lower energy electrons. And so it decreases the, the uh, degree of overlap, if you like, between excited and less excited states. As a result, the transitions that can occur within a core shell nanoparticle can be different. If those overlaps are weak between the two states, the initial and the final state, we'll have a weak transition we may have very poor luminescence from these materials. On the other hand, if we engineer a shell that's great at just cramming the electron in all of its possible states tightly inside the core, we can achieve a much more strongly luminescent structure. And so this is an example of something that we can do by engineering just on one more length scale beyond just the core itself, but by building these shells. In fact, we can build a quantum gobstopper. Uh, we can build structures that uh, embed many, many layers of shells growing out of them, where each one of those layers is used to manipulate uh, the structure of the material within. Now, when we talk about epitaxy and we talk about growth of crystals on other crystals, there we really need to think about these facets, these planes of atoms that exist. In fact, when you look at a nanoparticle and you think it's spherical, it really isn't. It's, uh, it may have many, many planes shaved off to look almost spherical, but it still has some structure. It has regions where certain atoms of one type are exposed, certain atoms of another type are exposed. Let's take as an example uh, a binary material, one that consists of tin and sulfur. Uh, well, if you were to slice it along certain axes, uh, you could see tin and sulfur atoms in equal uh, ratios, one-to-one -one ratio. But there are other axes on which you could slice it, the way you might imagine cleaving a diamond face. Uh, there are other axes where you would see only tin atoms, or axes where you'd see only sulfur atoms. This in turn allows us to engineer the uh, propensity for these materials or for these facets to react. Uh, and so this gives us the ability to differentiate certain facets from others. And so if you look at a nanoparticle that has an exposed facet off at some angle, well, perhaps we can engineer that facet to be one where we can grow an arm off of it while protecting the other facets that don't have the same degree of reactivity. Perhaps we can use organic molecules, such as these ligands that we've spoken about, to help us to keep one of those facets well protected. And we can make those organic ligands really pop off uh, of the facet that we want to grow our arm on. Uh, and so we can further engineer the uh, structural nature of these materials. Well, what can we do when we can control these facets? This is what really leads to the, the capacity to build things that are directional. Uh, and so you could say that our uh, quantum dots, are, we can call them uh, three-dimensionally confined systems where we've confined electrons in both horizontal planes and also in the vertical plane, uh, we can call these three-dimensionally confined or uh, zero-dimensional from the point of view of uh, the number of dimensions on which the states, the electronic states, are extended. 
Well, we can use that same concept to talk of materials that extend the electron along one axis but confine it along two. These we call one-dimensional materials where there's a propagation direction, one propagation direction. We also have what are called quantum wells where the electron can swim around freely within the plane and it's confined along only one axis. Well, these are now the kinds of materials that we can grow with the power of controlling directionality through controlling uh, the propensity to grow along certain facets. In fact, these ideas of 0D, 1D, 2D materials, these are really the same forces that are at work when we think about some of the carbon-based nanomaterials that are also so beautiful. Uh, Buckyballs have a lot in common uh, with quantum dots in the sense that they're confined along all three axes. Nanotubes, rolled up sheets of graphene, uh, allow propagation along their axis uh, and confinement in the other two dimensions. If you unroll one of those carbon nanotubes, you produce a graphene sheet. Electrons can skirt around within the plane, can move freely, but they are confined to reside within that plane. So they function more like quantum wells. And so these semiconductor, these traditional inorganic semiconductor materials like silicon and germanium with which we are able to grow various types of nanoparticles and the carbon-based or organic materials such as the buckyballs, nanotubes, and graphene, uh, they all have analogs of one another. They all can see uh, different degrees of confinement and propagation uh, engineered at the nanoscale. So that's one very uh, useful length scale to operate at. Uh, it's the building block length scale. It's the particle length scale. Um, but I think it's really interesting to think about whether we can build structures uh, out of those particles. And the, the easiest kind of material to think about building would be another periodic structure. It would be another crystal. Uh, in fact, you can think of it as a supercrystal, uh, a periodic array of nanoparticles, where, of course, each nanoparticle is itself internally a crystal. And here, Chris Murray, who was at IBM in some of his earlier work and is now at the University of Pennsylvania, has done some incredible work where he's shown how to take the semiconductor nanoparticles and get them to pack into perfectly regular arrays. And you might wonder, what are the requirements for doing that? Well, there are a couple. The first is... To make a perfectly ordered structure, all of your building blocks have to be the same as one another. It's like building a salt crystal. Uh, it's because all the sodiums are the same as one another and all the chlorines are the same as the other chlorines that you can get a perfectly regular array. If you were to have a bunch of impurities in there, uh, materials of different sizes included, you would eventually have, have a pretty big mess. And so building one of these super crystals or super lattice materials is reliant on making all the nanoparticles the same uh, we call that property monodispersity. We call it the property uh, of, of having every particle identical to all the others. And we've gotten pretty good at carrying out the synthesis of these nanoparticles to make them all identical. Uh, but when it's not perfect, even if it's not completely perfect, we have some other options available to us. For example, we're able to ensure that overly big nanoparticles that we don't want in the mix, we're able to cause them to precipitate out of solution. They can be particularly easy to cause to drop down to the bottom of the solution. So all we have left uh, are the smaller particles of the right size. This process known as size selector precipitation has been used now for two decades in order to produce increasingly monodispersed, increasingly pure sets of nanoparticles. Now the other ingredient that we need in order to build one of these supercrystals, something that's very regular, uh, is we need some kind of strategy to allow every atom, every constituent nanoparticle to find its place in the lattice. And that typically involves kind of a slow annealing or a slow growth. Uh, it would be like trying to build a really nice, big, large, uh, very organized crystal by allowing, say, uh, the liquid in which the precursors were contained, think of salt once again, allowing that, uh, that solution, say, allowing the water to evaporate very slowly to give every atom lots of time to find just the right crucible where it could reside in the ordered structure. Well, in this case of building nanoparticle super lattices, exactly the same idea is, is used. And there's a very clever way to accelerate that, which is through solvent mixtures. Uh, so researchers don't just use one solvent containing all these nanoparticles dispersed in them, drop a drop, let it die, let it dry. Uh, but instead, they use a uh, pair of solvents. The majority solvent, the one which they use a preponderance of, is one that, that evaporates pretty rapidly. And then a small fraction, maybe 10%. Uh, will be one that evaporates much more slowly. And so they put a droplet of this onto uh, typically a very smooth substrate. 
uh, allow the rapidly evaporating one to evaporate. And then you're left, left with this kind of gooey mass uh, where the nanoparticles are now are in a very dense concentrated solvent, and that solvent is uh, evaporating very slowly. Uh, and as a result, every nanoparticle has the chance to kind of look around, feel its way around the growing crystal that's emerging, find its lowest energy site, so find the region which enables it to form an ordered structure. Now there's another particularly beautiful result that Chris Murray has achieved, which is uh, not just to make uh, these super lattices out of a single particle, but to make them out of multiple different types of particles. Now this uh, reminds me a little bit of the amazing uh, tiles that you can see uh, often in the Middle East uh, if you go see some of the beautiful architecture there. Uh, you can see now periodic patterns that aren't just simple repetitions of a single, uh, a single repeat unit, but instead periodic patterns that have embedded within them sub-patterns as well. Uh, and so these kinds of mosaic or tiling ideas uh, have led to what's become known as binary superlattices. In binary superlattices, they add in another ingredient. They add in another degree of freedom. They allow us to uh, make materials that don't just have the properties of uh, a first or a second constituent, but that fuse those properties. And so Chris Murray and his group have used these ideas to make uh, sort of super semiconductor materials, ones based on two different types of constituents all ordered, uh, and where the uh, ability to propagate electrons and the ability to have an abundance of electrons are separately controlled uh, through the two constituents that make up these materials. Some beautiful work also coming from uh, Murray in a collaboration with Dimitri Talapin, who was with him at IBM and who now runs his own research group doing very exciting work at the University of Chicago, uh, has been to take these ideas of oriented attachment uh, and to extend them not, not just from being making these three-dimensional crystals, but taking individual nanoparticles and causing them to form a string, causing them to attach uh, along a one-dimensional axis. As a result, they've made incredibly long wires, micrometers long, out of nanometer-sized materials. These are obviously very prone to carry electronic charge along their length while still having the confinement, the quantum confinement, along the, uh, the direction that's perpendicular to the length axis of the wire. And the concept that they utilized, uh, that they uh, enabled them to explain how this worked was quite fascinating. It did involve these facets. It involved the fact that the constituent materials that are making up these crystals, uh, they obviously like each other. The reason you make uh, tin sulfide, the reason it's so naturally easy to make, uh, is that tin and sulfur really like each other. And so they made these nanoparticles consisting of tin and sulfur in equal concentrations, but where some of the exposed facets were tin-based and the others were almost purely sulfur-based. And so two nanoparticles would see each other, and if they ran into each other in solution and the sulfur facet was facing the tin facet, um, they would bind, and otherwise they wouldn't. And so they created an avenue towards then kind of a propagating idea where one got this growth of a longer and longer chain, an incredibly long, very ordered chains, and epitaxially connected chains, uh, kind of using an idea of complementarity, almost a yin and a yang between the different facets of the nanoparticles uh, being attracted to one another to form these oriented attachment structures. There are some other uh, really interesting and, and actually quite powerful materials concepts that have been developed as well. Uh, one of them is the idea of engineering tetrapods. Uh, so these structures have a bunch of legs pointing downwards and then one kind of arm or, if you like, a body uh, pointing upwards. And uh, along that uh, component that points upwards, of course, electron propagation is achieved very well. Uh, well, this is actually a very useful architecture the problem with wires on their own or just uh, nano rods is that if you plonk them all onto a surface, if you just sort of coat them down, well, they'll naturally be prone to lie down on that surface. Very few of them would point up. In fact, often none of them can. But with these tetrapods, uh, because of their legs, uh, you can ensure that they all plant three of their legs on the surface and they point their fourth uh, extension upwards. And so now they have conduction in the vertical direction uh, and they have this orientation that's enforced by their underlying structure. Uh, in fact, you might wonder, you know, how, how does it happen? How is that possible? Well, here we use crystals uh, that form tetrahedral structures, so where they have four exposed facets, all equally prone towards growth, and then we grow off of those facets. So we kind of create four substrates at various angles to each other, off of which growth of the rods can occur. 
And we do it heteroepitaxially, typically. We do it with one material to form the body off of which growth can occur, and a second material uh, that forms the basis for the arms. Uh, and so with this, uh, researchers have achieved really incredible control uh, over the formation of these new materials, which have all sorts of applications in making more controlled electronic structures. Now, this is a picture of something that looks like a pencil, and it gets called a, a nano pencil. In fact, you can even see the eraser on one side and a pointy end uh, on the other. And uh, uh, what it illustrates, this is an example of, of a structure that hasn't yet uh, found its utility. The eraser isn't actually uh, used as an eraser. Um, but what it illustrates is the idea that we, we are able now to combine multiple materials into a single nanoparticle. So we're able to include a metal here and a semiconductor over here. Uh, we're able to create a sense of orientation as well. And so uh, this ends up being a very uh, powerful idea. Uh, there's a front and a back to a structure. And so this is what allows things to uh, form chains as a result of having uh, a directionality to them. Another way to think of that is a polarization to it. Uh, there's a particular proneness for charge to flow in one direction. One can even imagine making little semiconductor materials, little junctions, little PN junctions or diodes, but now at the nanoscale and synthesized uh, in solution. This is one of my favorite pictures. It's from some beautiful work that Jin Mu Chan in Korea has done. Uh, it's one of his uh, nano stars, and he's, he's been one of the leaders in figuring out how to build such a diversity of different shapes. Uh, and, and he's really able to rationally engineer uh, from a knowledge of the crystal structure that will exist, from a knowledge of the facets that will be exposed, how he can then grow these uh, larger shapes, which extend outwards in all sorts of interesting directions. I'd like to turn now, having spent some time on the building blocks, uh, I'd like to turn to some of the architectures that we're able to create. And um, here I'd like to bring in DNA. DNA is a very powerful type of Velcro, effectively. Uh, we know lots uh, already from this course about the specific binding properties of DNA. We know that uh, a single-stranded DNA, when it encounters a complementary sequence of DNA, having exactly the, the complementary sequence, that they will bind, they will form uh, the, the duplex, uh, and that if there's a lack of a match, um, that they will, not, uh, they will not form that duplex. And so we have kind of a lock and key recognition system. It's like Velcro, but Velcro that will only stick to a very, very specific complementary piece of Velcro. Well, I think of this as just an incredibly powerful technique for the controllable construction of uh, structures that combine a bunch of different nanomaterials. Uh, it allows us, when we kind of label various different nanomaterials with different sequences of our DNA Velcro, uh, it allows us to uh, engineer potentially a diversity of structures this way. So let me start with a simple structure, and I'll go to some more complex ones that have emerged very recently. So the simple structure is illustrated here. It involves a series of nanowires uh, that, are, that are grown from the bottom up, and then it involves attaching a strand of DNA to the nanowires, a single-stranded piece of DNA, and uh, that single-stranded piece of DNA has a functional group on the end of it that makes it really want to stick to the surface of these nanowires. We do the same thing in a separate reaction vessel with a bunch of nanoparticles. And uh, there, though, we use a sequence of DNA that, of course, will bind to, uh, at its end to the nanoparticles and where that sequence is complementary to the one that we stuck on the rods. Then when we combine these two things, when we take the nanoparticles in solution and put them on top of these nanorods, uh, there's an opportunity for specific hybridization to occur. So this image is showing, uh, and this is actually some of Shana Kelly's beautiful work from a couple of years ago, this image is showing how we're able to sort of take two different classes of nanostructures and fuse them or combine them in a rational way uh, in order to form a new nanostructured material. You can think of it as, as uh, forming a nanostructured material building uh, on a higher length scale uh, or a higher degree, a higher order, a higher hierarchy uh, as a result of uh, combining pre-synthesized nanoparticles in a way that provides a lot, a lot of control. Well, this concept, the idea of uh, hybridizing uh, uh, DNA with itself and then uh, using as, as building blocks nanoparticles that have single strands tethered to one another, this, was a this is a concept that Shana and I thought was very interesting and that could allow us to engineer even more complicated structures uh, than what, we're, uh, what we showed there. 
Uh, so our, our concept was this, that we could, we could have a number of different nanoparticle types, uh, perhaps different colors. We could have a red emitter that would, uh, that would emit light around 600 nanometer wavelength, a green emitter that would emit at around 500 nanometer wavelength, and a blue emitter in the sort of 400 nanometer uh, wavelength range. And that we could label each one of these with a different sequence, a very carefully chosen sequence of DNA. And that furthermore, we thought that we could introduce uh, the possibility of controlling how many DNA strands would adhere to each one of these nanoparticles, each one of these quantum dots. And you can see now already that we're, we're starting to develop a bit of an analogy with the periodic table. And the periodic table that we spoke about earlier, uh, we had this, uh, we have this potential for one or two or three or four valence electrons to be available for binding. And the kind of uh, marriages that are formed, the kinds of proclivities amongst different atoms in the periodic table, these are all determined by the valency, by the number of electrons available for binding on the outer surface. Well, with this DNA concept, we were kind of building an analogy with that valency idea. We were putting uh, a programmable number of different strands on the surface. Uh, and so when we uh, started with a large inner nanoparticle having a, um, uh, let's say, four uh, pieces of DNA on it that displayed a certain sequence, when we then introduced to couple to that, uh, say, a green class of nanoparticles having the complementary sequence, we were able to ensure that the center nanoparticle had exactly four green nanoparticles bound to it. And then we were able to extend this idea even further. We were able to introduce a third class of nanoparticles that would bind to the second class of nanoparticles. So we were able to build from an inner core nanoparticle, we were able to build uh, crosses or uh, triangular structures, and then we were able to build out from there as well. Well, once we'd made these things, uh, you know, initially we did it because it seemed like such a, a fascinating challenge that you could build designer nanostructured materials, kind of an analogy with building molecules from the atoms in the periodic table, that you could design these nanostructured materials in a controlled fashion, and uh, all you had to do was kind of combine ingredients. You didn't have to do anything yourself at the nanoscale. Uh, you just got all of these materials to organize. So it seemed like just a neat thing to do and something that led to some beautiful images, some very, uh, very aesthetically appealing results. But nevertheless, once we built these structures, we asked ourselves, well, what kind of special properties do they have? How do they behave like things that go beyond just kind of mixing together two vats or three vats of materials? Uh, how do they actually evince the fact that we've coupled uh, these materials to one another? Uh, and where we went looking was on how energy is communicated amongst these nanoparticles. So uh, we actually ended up making a structure where the outermost set of nanoparticles uh, possessed excited electrons when you illuminated it uh, at the highest available energy state, and that the inner ring uh, had a, a sort of middling energy excited state level, and that the very heart of the structure had the lowest energy. And what that meant is that when we photo excited the outer ring, it was very inclined, energy was very inclined to trickle downhill. And so the energy would pour into the uh, inner shell, uh, and then the energy would further pour all the way into the very uh, center constituent nanoparticle. Uh, and what we were able, the way we were able to see this, the way we were able to uh, measure this was that uh, even though we were exciting very brightly luminescent materials in the outer ring, uh, once we coupled them into these called artificial molecules, as we termed them, uh, we were no longer able to see any light coming out of the materials on the outer shell because they'd, they transferred it all into the heart of our structure. So we'd really built a, an energy funnel. We kind of built a concentrator where we could uh, illuminate one of these complexes, or in fact, we were illuminating many of these complexes at the same time. Uh, and we could have an absorption from this complex that was proportional to the number of nanoparticles. And these complexes were starting to get quite big, so they had quite large absorption. But all of the energy would be funneled within the complex because of the architectures that we've built. It would all be funneled towards a center material. And we realized once we'd done this and once we saw the results, which were so striking, I mean, the spectra just spoke eloquently to us that we'd really coupled strongly together uh, these nanoparticle structures. Uh, we realized that we had really built something that was an analogy with the way in which the photosynthetic apparatus acts in plants. Uh, in plants, there exists what are called light harvesting antennas. Uh, and in these, uh, the idea is that if only the uh, regions that actually uh, translated 
uh, photonic energy into excited states, translated that into stored chemical potential energy. If only those reaction centers were present, then the efficiency of plants, of leaves, would be very, very low because the absorbance from those centers would be very low. So instead, plants have evolved uh, systems that function like antennas. They actually kind of extend their reach for light absorption the way an antenna extends its reach for the absorption of, of electromagnetic radiation of radio, radio waves. They extend this reach, uh, and then they all funnel all of that energy down towards the reaction center. Well, we had done the same thing with these uh, multi-length scale structured molecular complexes, and we had shown that the efficiency with which we're able to capture and transfer the energy towards our virtual reaction center was extremely high. Almost all of the energy ended up right at the heart of these structures. The uh, other concept that I found very appealing about this work um, was just that uh, it turned out to be a tunable reaction. This is something that one doesn't find uh, in uh, the photosynthetic apparatus. Uh, but we were able to turn on and off this phenomenon. Uh, and the way we did that is we just changed the pH within these structures or within the solutions these structures found themselves in. Uh, and so at certain pHs, the charge uh, on these materials was, was revealed. It was exposed effectively. And uh, because all of the different constituents of these artificial molecules had the same charge, they were prone to repel each other. Now, we detached them too tightly for them to blow up. Uh, but what happened is they, they, they took an extended conformation. They spread out. And so the constituent particles are now far apart, and the amount of energy transfer was essentially turned off. And so when these were in their extended state that we controlled through the solution conditions, uh, every nanoparticle acted essentially like an independent nanoparticle. There was no energetic coupling. But when we changed the pH in order to enable these structures to collapse or condense into smaller, more dense structures, uh, only then did we turn back on this reaction. Uh, and so we'd made a, a tunable uh, system. I mean, it was always functioning as a light harvester, but we were able to turn on and off its funnel. We were able to turn on and off its propensity to transfer the energy to the reaction center. Another way to think about it is we made a pretty good sensor for pH. We were able to test the, acid the acidity or the basicity of the solution that our nanoparticles were in through the spectral signatures that were coming out of the light that was being emitted from these materials. My final example for this lecture on nanomotifs uh, draws in the work of Angela Belcher, a professor who does incredible stuff at MIT. Uh, professor Belcher uh, has really uh, made her name by uh, merging the world of the biological, including things like viruses, uh, with the world of nanoparticles. And what she's been able to do is build uh, uh, viruses that have coats that are particularly prone to grow certain nanoparticles on their surfaces. Uh, and so she's able to engineer materials which take on the shape of the virus because she's able to effectively epitaxially grow semiconductor nanoparticles off of the surfaces of these viruses in a very selective way. And she's further combined that field of semiconductors and material science uh, with the field of genetic engineering uh, in that she's uh, been able to uh, find which proteins displayed on the surface of these viruses uh, allows her to grow with particular uh, success, with particularly high yield, uh, these nanostructured materials. And so it illustrates the fact that uh, when we think about building nanomotifs, we don't have to limit ourselves to thinking only about, say, inorganic semiconductors or only about organic materials like uh, uh, buckyballs and nanotubes, but that we can even get biological entities and even life forms in this case uh, into the game for engineering on many length scales. Uh, to summarize this lecture, we've seen that nanotechnology clearly provides us with this incredible diversity of building blocks. It goes well beyond the quantum dots that we've seen lots of or rods, um, but it also through the crystal facet engineering capability, it allows us to build uh, structures that are beautiful uh, and, and fascinating. They remind me a little bit of the, the shape games that my two-year-old's uh, two-year-old plays at home where he's able to match his triangle up with a triangle and his puzzle and uh, such a diversity of interesting shapes that are uh, beautiful and fascinating to look at. Um, I think we've just scratched the surface of what we can do on that front, but we certainly already can do a lot of things. Once we have these building blocks, uh, the next 
step uh, in nanotechnology is that we uh, take them, we typically have to functionalize them, we typically have to do something so that they're prone to interact with each other uh, in a certain way. And when we do this, we're able to make structures that are like tiled mosaics, uh, in the case of super lattices, or that form extended crystals along a single axis, like the oriented attachment wires. And then finally, especially when we bring in biology, when we bring in the power of DNA specificity, uh, or when we bring in uh, the capability to build a nanostructure on the code of a virus, um, we can go higher and higher in the hierarchy uh, of building up these structures. Uh, it's really the idea of specificity uh, that enables this remarkable degree of control, all of it engineered from the bottom up.